Yeah, good afternoon and welcome very much to our second lecture on planetary health dimensions. And I'm really happy that you all joined us for this morning, this afternoon or this evening, whatever time it might be at your place. And uh, today we are having a closer look on two different aspects of planetary health and Martin and me are guiding you through the lecture again as last time. So together with Gary Belking, we are focusing on mental health, a topic that has often receives too little attention, either due to ignorance or maybe even stigma. And Nuziku Munyunda will guide us through the health effects of environmental pollution. And then in the end, uh, Sonja Schönberg is telling us a little bit about how you can implement your own module on planetary health at your university. So these are obviously only a few aspects of planetary health and we are covering more in the next lectures, like for example, urbanization or also gender dimensions. So before we start with the content, I would like to make three more announcements. The first one is, as you might have already seen the link in the chat, the launch of the 2020 report of the Lancet Commission on Climate Change and Health is taking place tomorrow. And we're really happy, again, that CLU could initiate a German policy brief together with the German doctor, German doctor chamber, yeah, and the Helmholtz Institute and the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research as partners. And the launch event for the German policy brief is taking place at 10 a.m. Central European time tomorrow. And the one for the global launch is taking place at 4 p.m. Um, Central European time. And that's also the reason why we rescheduled the international exchange event that formally took place at that exact time originally. And we, uh, the new date is just one week later, so the 10th of December, the same time, so 4 p.m. Central European time. And the idea is to have a chance to meet each other, to exchange ideas, opinions, and experiences on planetary health. And the last uh, final announcement is that we're really happy that Austrian doctors can now get credits as well, and also uh, nutritionists from Switzerland, and that's you too, Zonia. Thank you very much. So let's start with Gary Balkin. So Gary, you're a doctor specialized, specialized in psychiatry, and you earned your master at Harvard uh, at the Public School of Public Health there. You're a former executive deputy commissioner in the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And recently you founded the Billion Minds Institute, Maybe you can even tell us a little bit more about that um, later. But to start, I would like to ask you a question. When you started studying medicine, did you already envision yourself working in the city department of New York one day? Oh, you're still muted. Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, Sylvia. Good to see you again. And uh, the 700 people already on, it's, it's wonderful to be able to have this conversation. Um, so yes, I, um, I went into medical school because I was interested in the social aspects of health and illness um, and, uh, and tried to find ways to not be a clinician, um, uh, but to really think about how do you work on changing what drives health in the population and its connection to other social issues. And when I, I remember when I was in college, I said, you know, my dream job would be to be the health commissioner of New York City. Um, and I ended up being the, the mental health commissioner of New York City. It was not, however, some intentional, you know, from that day forward, I, 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 I worked on that goal. It sort of ended up that way because I just stuck to my passion of working in that interface of, of society and health. And, and, and that's, that's why, how you land places, I think, is, is just by going with what uh, you enjoy doing every day and, and, and having it unfold. And I think actually I know some of our students and I think that's like an issue that really, um, how do you say it in English, but I think many students think about this like a lot. And I also know that many medical students who think like, oh, medicine is quite often, it's just really one dimensional. And in med school, we get the idea that uh, medical problems are only solved in the hospital. And I think that therefore it's really interesting also. So. But you trained as a doctor, so you worked um, yeah. as a psychiatrist for some years. Yes, yes. Okay. And I, and I also, along the way, because I, uh, I don't know, I wanted to punish myself. 
at the same time I was in residency training, I, I did work towards a doctorate in history and um, in the history of science. And I have to say that really sealed the deal for me in, in thinking about society uh, closely. It, it was a whole other uh, set of methods and tools and a community of people to think with about um, how society drives all this. And um, we as physicians and people in clinical medicine need to make more friends with these other disciplines that take society seriously. And what kind of topic did you choose? So I was interested in how we talk about ethics in medicine um, and, and thinking of that in a, in, a, in a historical way. What are the historical forces that drive the, the forms that that takes? Yeah. And maybe a few more words on the Billion Minds Institute. What are you doing there? What's your goal? What's your vision with this? Yeah, so well, as you'll hear as I talk about how I got involved in connecting mental health and climate change, it's um, we have to really change how we think about mental health. Um, we should always care about one person at a time, but we really have to think on the scale of literally billions. Um, how are these events, um, these ecologically scaled, you know, hugely transformative events happening, um, affecting us psychologically, emotionally, socially, at the same scale. And, um, and what, what do us mental health people have, you know, have to do with that? Um, well, I, I think we have a lot to do with that, but we have to change what we do. And I think transformations can have like a positive impact and uh, motivating you. And also of course, then the maybe the more negative impact or yeah, the more, yeah. Yes, exactly. So cool. And ethics, just to have a, a short notice on that, we're going to talk about that in two weeks. So oh, great. if you want to join, you're very welcome. Yeah, yeah. We have a variety of people. So we're looking forward to your presentation. I would Thank say. you. So I'm doing that now. Yeah. Cool. Okay, very good. So what I want, I'm going to talk about mental health and climate change, but what I want to really talk about is changing our associations of mental health with climate change and mental health in general. Uh, to be thinking about, um, as I was saying, uh, how what we know about mental health is relevant at a social level, is relevant to something that I've been calling the social climate. Um, and to think of the social climate as um, a, a goal and a purpose and a set of circumstances that we desperately need, that humanity desperately needs um, to um, uh, get through and endure uh, uh, ecological change and to step up to the challenge of facing it. Um, so it's really connecting this uh, notion that we tend to have about mental health and mental illness, which is very individual, um, illness specific, um, and, and isolated from social forces that often drive it, and trying to rebuild the real connections that exist there, what we understand about emotional resilience and trauma um, and, and psychological um, well-being, um, really uh, have a lot to do, not only with keeping us mental, mentally healthy through all this, but in actually uh, building the social capital to take this on. Uh, so a much bigger playing field for mental health than we're used to is what I'm arguing for. Um, so uh, this basically summarizes what I'm going to say. Uh, the climate crisis is here. Uh, we have to stop talking about it in the future tense. Um, it is here, it is already overwhelming. Um, and I mean overwhelming emotionally and socially. It's, it's stressing our social fabric. It's hurting us uh, with mental health and psychological morbidity. And we talk a lot about what we need to face the climate crisis in terms of hardware, of new energy systems, food systems, um, but not about the software. We need not only those other kinds of, uh, of systems and, and financial resources to take on climate change, but we also need psychological resources to endure, to really to endure and to take on these challenges. So the, the psychological dimension is not just about um, getting by through the trauma of this, uh, but and traumas of this, but also as the glue to stick together um, to uh, face up to and implement solutions where we live. Um, so for the mental health field, so to get to that big picture for the mental health field, um, it means getting out of a habit or, or moving in addition to a habit 
of thinking about episodes and individuals to really think about ecosystems um, and society. Um, and uh, this is true, I think, in general about how the health system sees its relationship to climate change, that the field of planetary health is trying to break apart, that the medical reflex of thinking about episodes and individuals um, has to always care about that, but has to also understand how um, health systems uh, are an important force for getting us to think of and take care of humanity at the level of ecosystems and um, society. So um, if anything has brought home that point, it's uh, the, co the current pandemic. Um, uh, this was a, a cartoon that appeared in March, literally at the cusp of, of uh, lockdowns here in the US and globally, um, where this accelerated attention to this pandemic and the disappearance of what had been a rise of attention to climate change. You see in this uh, cartoon, two people are watching the onslaught of of tornadoes and hurricanes and re size, you know, you know, rising seas and saying, um, well, maybe we should just change the name to pandemic and it'll get attention. Um, but the thing that a lot of us already know and is underscored in a report that appeared at the same time in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and has been reiterated is COVID is climate change. Um, pandemics are a result uh, and tied to unsustainable environmental wildlife and food system practices. And so it is here. Climate change is here. Everything the climate activists have been talking about, about what will happen when there is systems failure and widespread disruption um, and, un and widespread uncertainty and loss, uh, this, is, this is it. And it has become increasingly <laughs> easier for me uh, to talk to my mental health colleagues and say, we have to get out of uh, individuals and episodes and appreciate what happens when societies are traumatized, when communities are traumatized, when we lose the social fabric and collective cohesion to act in the face of these issues. And we as mental health professionals have to use our skills and our presence and what we can do um, to take that on and build out and bolster what I call the social climate. And you can see some movement from episodes and individuals to societies in what have been the typical ways that mental health has been talked about in climate change, which is in a very clinical one person at a time sort of way. Um, so for example, this is a, a tour of work on heat and mental health um, uh, in the heat waves. The left hand box here uh, summarizes meta-analysis data that shows that um, uh, the, the highest comorbidity risk of death in a, in a heat wave is having a mental illness. Um, surpassing the, the risk rate, the odds ratios for cardiovascular illness or, or pulmonary illness. Um, so that tells clinicians, um, you know, my patient's mental illness, and you know, when a heat wave comes, I have to, you know, make sure that they're aware of that and, and I take care of them. Um, and there have been reviews of uh, how um, heat itself exacerbates symptoms of mental illness, severity, emergency room visits, uh, et cetera, can affect pharmacology. Uh, dehydration effects um, can cause hyponatremia, uh, you know, puts people on certain psychotropics at high rates of hyponatremia. Um, but all of that kind of stuff was geared towards cl giving clinicians uh, something to know and do uh, with the patients in front of them. But there's been increasingly work, like uh, here on the bottom right, that's been looking at, at larger population-wide things to think about, not just episodes like heat waves or specific uh, individuals, but for example, this is about 30 years of data that appeared in Nature of um, showing how heat increases, uh, monthly average heat increases by county level in the US and Mexico uh, have a direct correlation with increased suicide risk. Um, so that tells us something that's going on at a societal level, at a, at a, at a large ecological level. And so about, about, a, about you know, this mental health outcome. So what do we do about that? How do we act? policy-wise, health systems-wise, to deal with that kind of ecological, social, scaled um, uh, issue. Um, and you have work like Heat Wave here, uh, a book by Eric Kleinenberg, that, um, that uh, actually looked at the risk of death. Uh, yes, individual mortality matters, individual diagnoses matters in terms of who dies in heat waves. But what really saved people in, in what he really looked at as a sociologist in, in a horrible heat wave in the mid 90s in Chicago was that social fabric, social connections, social ties is what saved people. 
And that was at a neighborhood level. That's at a community level. So if we in the medical profession care about mortality and heat, we should be thinking about, okay, how do we build, how are we part of building social fabrics, the social climate that is what helps people. Um, similarly, the mental health climate change literature is often about specific adverse weather events and trauma, so hurricanes and floods and wildfires, um, in which there is great evidence that, um, and uh, deepening evidence that events like this can deep, um, highly escalate, you know, doubling, tripling um, incidents of um, uh, depression, trauma, suicide, substance use. Um, but again, a lot of that work has been around discrete episodes, um, weather events that pass, um, wildfires that end, um, and not really this long-term, what happens when the background becomes chronic hurricanes, chronic temperature rises, chronic um, heat waves. Uh, the, type, the top right also shows evolving, uh, it reminds me to, to signal also evolving evidence about air pollution and mental illness. It seems like in, um, incremental increase in uh, particulate matter from uh, pollution um, also correlates with similarly incremental increases in major depression in a population. Um, and that gets more at, okay, if there are these ecological, large, enduring, persistent patterns of change, then, then what does that mean in terms of how we approach uh, mental health and reach people at a population a level. And then, uh, and you, if you look at some of the review uh, pieces, uh, the literature that reviews, uh, the systematic reviews of the state of the literature on mental health and climate change, it kind of follows this historical path of starting with individuals and ending up with society and ecologies. Um, one of the most widely quoted and recent uh, such review, which is a good, uh, and I, I will share all these slides, by the way, so you can track down these things if you want. But this was a report, um, a summary report uh, by the American Psychological Association with a group called Eco-America. Um, the, um, I think the um, IPCC's next round of assessments is going to actually include, um, this is the International Panel on Climate Change, uh, a report, which will then be the most exhaustive definitive report of the psychological aspects of, of climate change in 2022. Um, but the person who's lead author on that also is the author of this. And it, if you read it, it goes through these layers of the onion. It starts with, okay, how does this affect individuals? How are people affected after specific, you know, discrete events like a hurricane, et cetera? Okay, what happens? What do we think are the effects of, the, of those things when they become chronic um, and not just episodes? And then, okay, what is what is that effect in terms of how those things cause disruptions. So, you know, pr pr prolonged drought and heat not only has its direct mental health effects, but affects food supplies and migration and displacement. Um, what, are, what, are the mental, what do we know about the mental health and traumatic effects of that, which are huge? And then there's yet even a further layer out. What does, what's happening to all of us who aren't living through these things, but are scared of these things? What, what is things like eco-anxiety, climate uh, um, uh, anxiety, um, uh, ecological grief, um, the kind of anticipatory background sense of a, of a shortened future, of a, dis of a disrupted future, particularly in youth? What's, what's the mental health impact of that? So you add all these layers and you're just starting now um, to grasp what, um, uh, uh, you know, what we should be talking about, the scale, the scope of what we should be talking about when we talk about mental health and climate change is moving beyond specific illness in specific episodes. But really, how is this weighing and changing and um, impairing uh, society and health uh, uh, broadly? Um, and this issue of climate anxiety is, is starting to get more traction, not just as a um, as a term, uh, a popular term, uh, but um, being more carefully measured. Um, uh, Susan Clayton um, uh, has done more work in trying to get to really show how these things uh, that we talk about can be more systematically measured and scaled and has evidence, um, and you can read this paper on the bottom right, um, that it looks like uh, this kind of worry 
um, uh, carries with it some impairment, the kind of impairment that you tend to see in things like major depression, people reporting that it interferes um, uh, with uh, their daily life, with enjoying things, with being able to concentrate sleep, um, et cetera. So um, if you add all these layers um, uh, of uh, impact and these layers of disruption uh, that affects emotional well-being and mental health, you get to things like this. Um, uh, this is work by Helen Berry, um, a, a summary diagram of a, a really great article she did in Nature that actually looks at the literature of all these layers in the, in, the, in the case of drought. So you see drought in this little, it's over here. And then she follows what the literature says drought causes. And then she looks at those literatures about what those things cause and so on and so forth. And shows, and it really details this web, this, this degree of complexity and, and um, you know, uh, real all of, all sector, all society uh, impacts and, and um, dots that connect from, from this ecological impact that end in these endpoints of depression, of increased suicide, of increased anxiety symptoms, um, and which go through all these potential pathways that, the, that, that there is, each arrow, there's literature supports. She, there's literature that supports. She pulled that all together. To just show the complex ecology the complex social ecology of these uh, mental health um, endpoints. And I, and I think that's really important for a bunch of reasons. One, um, it again uh, tells us that mental health, these mental health outcomes really are embedded in much larger social forces. Um, but what I wish uh, she also did, because this wasn't enough, was to show how these, each of these arrows are bi-directional. Um, there's, so increased anxiety um, also affects, goes back and affects household and family stress, which goes back and affects employment and financial constraints. So these are cycles. These are not just unidirectional. Um, and those cycles uh, have these broad social effects. They corrode and impair all these, how households work, how employment works, how economic stability works how relationships work, how community um, uh, cohesion and connectivity work. So mental health and climate change isn't just about, you know, depression or trauma after a hurricane. It's about the core stability of our collective efficacy, um, resilience, our civic strength. Um, and so we as mental health professionals um, have to worry about a lot more uh, than a specific uh, way that people may be more anxious, but how collectively at a population level, at a level of a billion minds, um, this plays out to really affect and impair uh, society because all of these burdens translate into premature mortality. Um, all of these uh, burdens, uh, uh, these cycles of burdens um, translate into um, uh, the inability to actually uh, have the social strength and um, uh, collective uh, will to act on climate change itself. And again, COVID illustrates this in spades. Um, it shows us not only the huge mental health burden from a planetary, planetary size scale problem like this. Uh, here's data that appeared in the US that showed a doubling, tripling, maybe even quadrupling of levels of depression and anxiety um, in, uh, um, I think they looked at May it or April to June of last year from COVID. Um, that is just a stunning, um, this is across the US population. That is a stunning uh, kind of mental health uh, impact. Um, this is a dashboard of an online web on demand kind of counseling service called Seven Cups. This was around the end of February, early March. You can see the need for um, immediate on-demand counseling just skyrocket. What is happening in our communities and our societies where this is going on, where this kind of burden and this kind of distress um, is going on? And that's been getting attention. That aspect of the mental health implications of all this, COVID has really drawn attention to that, that just hasn't happened before. Governments talking about social cohesion, 
um, and, and um, uh, emotional resilience. Um, work that I did in creating something called Thrive NYC, which I'll talk a bit about more in a second, um, hosted community forums on the relation between mental health, equity, and resilience. Um, acknowledging that these mental health burdens weren't just individual episodic mental health burdens, but they were burdens on the ability of communities to act and to stay together. Um, so what, I, what I'm saying here is, as I, as I said at the outset, is that we need not just material resources, economic resources, um, uh, technical and structural change resources to take on climate change, but we need psychological resources. And it's not gonna work to be psychological resources that are built and invested in one person at a time. It has to be at the population community level. So it means changing our mindset as a mental health community, as mental health systems, as mental health policymakers, as mental health educators, people who are training mental health professionals, to stop just sitting in this part of the spectrum of mental illness in the population and understanding that it's our aim as a mental health community and as mental health clinicians to think about the wholeness of where people are at in their psychological resources and how do we shift the curve of the whole population to the right so that more of the population um, has more rich psychological resources to, um, to, to come to these only growing ecological um, crises. And that we're talking about building population-wide uh, resilience and appreciating that population-wide emotional resilience is a cornerstone for public policy uh, in a climate age. And that has to be uh, understood as what we talk about when we're talking about mental health uh, and climate change. So that's easy to say, we got to move this curve, we got to bolster population-wide resilience, emotional resilience. Um, how do we do that? Luckily, we have a lot of off-the-shelf understanding of how to do that. Um, and it, but it means shifting the paradigm from the health system to community systems and how health systems bolster and build the capacity of community systems. Um, so we get there, we get to shifting those curves to building psychological resources through building community capacity and leadership. And the field of global mental health, which is where I, it was really, by the way, Sylvia, my, that was my path to becoming a, a mental health commissioner, was working in Sub-Saharan Africa, was working in, in, uh, um, in Haiti after the earthquake, in building mental health where there were no mental health professionals and realizing that so many skills, so many, uh, so many of the tasks that we have thought in the West and the North need to be done by skilled clinicians can be done by teachers and community health workers and clergy and, and um, uh, a, lo a lot of, a, a of non-professionals. And that's what the, the field of global mental health, um, which the field of planetary health does not pay enough attention to. Um, has really built a deep evidence base, a lot of methods that make operationalizable and doable and scalable this notion of what they call task sharing. A lot of the tasks that we left to the system, the clinical system can actually be done by community systems. With the community, with, I'm sorry, with the, with the clinical systems being crucial coaches and supports and, and backups, safety nets to those community, uh, to that community work. Some of this has been done in the US, something called Community Partners in Care or CPIC, which was a hundred member coalition of barbershops and human service agencies um, that were skilled by um, clinical partners in basic skills like motivation, things called motivational interviewing or behavioral activation, basic counseling skills, where they worked with people in their community as the front line around trauma, depression, and issues like that. And when you addressed mental health that way in this real ecological approach. They also reduced homelessness and his for risk for homelessness. In other words, they started getting at those arrows in Helen Berry's diagram by changing the way the entry points of doing the work of mental health. Um, that model of CPIC actually had a climate application in New Orleans after uh, Hurricane Sandy, which is about 10 years ago now, almost 15 years ago. Um, they applied exactly that model in New Orleans um, where they trained people in the neighborhood, devastated, um, flattened neighborhoods in, in New Orleans. They, they trained uh, community members 
in depression counseling skills went door to door. And that was woven within a community led effort to also get together, how are we rebuilding our community? So it really, again, connected those dots between collective efficacy and social action for addressing things like climate solutions with and fueled by and supported by also doing the work of emotional resilience and recovering from uh, the traumas of, of the work. Um, so we still, when I moved to my role at, at, in, the, in the health department, I stole all this stuff and realized, you know, this isn't just for a disaster or for the global South. This is how mental health systems have to work. This is how mental health policy has to be. And we just stole shamelessly from, from the global South. Um, there was something called friendship benches, a, a top right photo in Zimbabwe that trained grandmothers to do depression counseling outside of primary care centers because that was a credible place for people to go rather than into the primary care settings to get mental health assistance. We did bottom right something called uh, the um, uh, friendship benches in New York City, the same friendship benches, but they were pop-up. We took them to neighborhoods where there were, where was gun violence. We took them to neighborhoods where there were recent suicides and housing complexes. Um, we moved, we changed the real estate of mental health um, to be portable and really present um, in these other community spaces. So when I was in the health department, I developed something called Thrive NYC, which uh, this, this, this uh, map to the right of New York City summarizes each, each color is a different target population. It might be uh, school-aged youth, it might be pregnant mothers, it might be people with substance use, um, but each dot is, 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 um, shows where we did interventions. Um, and every one of these dots is work, is interventions outside of the mental health system. Um, they're in schools, they're in street corners, they're in primary care practices, they're in homeless shelters, where the basic idea was to skill those people to do skills to reach um, uh, the folks that, that they were taking care of, uh, whether it was employment training or whether it was giving them housing or whatever it was, teaching them. Um, uh, that both help them reach people that the mental health system will never reach, just at scale or just in, in terms of, of capacity, um, but also helped all these other in social institutions do their job better. So job training programs did their job training pr program work better by also having the skill set of engaging people around the emotional burdens that they were facing, whether it's depression, anxiety, trauma, et cetera. So what we did was, I like this map because it helps visualize, we changed the real estate of where mental health happens. And we also, top right, top left, these are all different city agencies. We changed the owners. We diversified who owned the work. So if we're doing it in the schools, well, that means the Department of Education has to understand, okay, how do we administer something like this? How do we train teachers? How do we scale this up in our system? So all these agencies, Department of Education, criminal justice system, police department, Department of Aging, Department of Youth Development, Department of, of Economic Opportunity, they all became co-owners of, of this work. So we made it cross-sector, we made it ownership diverse, diverse and um, geographically diverse. We changed the real estate. That is how you get to move that curve. That is how you get to build psychological resources in the community. And the key role of the mental health system was to be partners to all those dots. All those dots reflect some kind of partnership or support role of mental, of mental health experts and clinicians to um, help those things work. So how do we make that the new normal? How do we make that so health professionals don't just see themselves as doing one person at a time episodic work, but are part of building the capacity uh, 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 capabilities of systems and societies and communities? The US has had some experience with that, with um, uh, health, some health systems that are represented by these, by these logos, trying to work with community coalitions to bring uh, success in structural and social determinants of health and really affecting more upstream outcomes. They've had varying success. It's a new habit. Um, but there is precedent to believe that we can actually move the health system in that way. So what I've been doing now, among other things, is to try to build a coalition of, of mental health uh, of organizations to think, okay, how do we make that the new normal? How do we create the conditions where our mental health systems 
are, are paid to partner in that way, where our mental health professionals are trained to act in that way. Um, uh, and so this is a, a group called the Social Climate Leadership Group uh, that I put together um, uh, with a lot of the leading mental health organizations in the US and public health and um, some climate groups as well, where we're trying to think, okay, how does policy um, uh, get to understand, get its head around this paradigm of the social climate and also try to make it um, happen. And I'll just close um, by saying, uh, if, if, if we're gonna do it, if we're gonna do this as health systems and health professionals, we're gonna be part of this shift to the social climate. Um, we have to get a little pissed off. We have to get a little angry um, at how the current system is becoming increasingly distant from the real ways of protecting the population's health and of mobilizing the population to action to save ourselves from the current pandemic we're in, uh, let alone the future only worsening series of ecological disruptions uh, that we're gonna face. I, uh, this all came together for me getting arrested. I'm the, I'm the guy with the, with the, with the gray um, uh, cap on, getting handcuffed. Um, uh, I, I found that that, was, that that felt good in the moment. Um, but I realized as a health professional, I had more than my body to put on the line. We really have institutions, knowledge, uh, um, intellectual capital, logistical capital, and actual capital um, to help our communities uh, build the social climates that they're going to need. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gary, and especially for the quote from in the end with that we have more than our bodies to put on the line. I really like that. And I was also wondering because, you know, I really like the term of health and all policies. And I saw this in your talk, but I still, oh, I, at the same time, I realized that this kind of term has its limits. And I was wondering if you might have a, a new concept or a new word for that, but we can also talk about this in our discussion later. And I will hand over to Martin. Thank you very much, Silvia, and thank you very much, Gary. Very inspiring and very passionate speech. Um, I think it's one of the key facets that you were pointing to. We need to move from the individual to the community. We need to all be community builders and community leaders. I think without that, also what we are trying to do in planetary health and in uh, our activities in Kluge and Health for Future we will not be successful. And it's in a way challenging because uh, all the education system is built around training you for individualistic interventions and not looking at the collective. Um, on one level, what you are presenting is very close to what we will hear now from the Siku, but this is moving to the other end of the world, kind of. You are in one of the most kind of urbanistic um, places that you can imagine. No Siku uh, lives in Zambia. And she's a lecturer and researcher for environmental, for environmental pollution and toxicology in the School of Public Health of the University of Zambia. Uh, she has studied environmental science and management and has a specific expertise in natural resource management and environmental engineering. And her current research focus is on impact of climate change, economic development and pollution on health. And Nosiko, you are also started to support the emergence of the planetary health hub in Eastern Africa. That's how we got to know each other. Um, and um, before you go to your, your presentation, what I would like to know is kind of what brought you to this issue of environment? What brought you where you are now? What is the passion that is driving you? Okay. Okay, good, good evening, Martin. Um, good evening, Gary. Good morning, it must be morning or afternoon in New York. And um, hello to everyone. Thank you for having me in this lecture. So to, to answer your question, Martin, of what brought me to environmental issues, it actually started when I was just about 15. And I, I was part of a club that we called the Wildlife Conservation Club in my school. And we, we had a debate on um, future generations, will they find a habitable earth? That was the question for our debate. And as we researched for that debate, it just ignited that fire in me. I started thinking about this earth as not just belonging to us, but how are we taking care of this earth for future generations as well? So 
that continued throughout my secondary education. And obviously when I went to university, I studied natural resources management. I actually, I was alone in that stream. I, I, I graduated alone in my particular year because I, I was very passionate about this. And, and um, the path led me to doing environmental engineering and so on. And now um, I've moved more from the environmental side and trying to link the environmental side to health. Because before I joined the university, I worked for the regulator. I don't think you know this, but I worked for what the equivalent of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, but the Zambian version. So I worked for about 10 years there and I started asking the questions again. You know, we're giving licenses for people literally to pollute. You know, you set the limits, but you're licensing them to pollute without really understanding what's happening to the people, what's happening to the environment, what's happening to the wildlife, what's happening to the water. And this prompted me to move to the academic sector to now try to understand these linkages more, do more research, um, teach, you know, teach, mentor, and just have more, more soldiers in this army of, of trying to link environment and health. So I guess that's, that, that's the background, Nancy. Great. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation now. Yes, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to share what's happening. Okay, thank you, Felix, and thank you, everyone. I've already been introduced. My name is Nasiko Munyenda from the School of Public Health, Department of Environmental Health. And um, as Sylvia said earlier on, I'll look at um, pollution and, and health. Okay. So just building on what Gary has been talking about, what we have there is the interplay, the different impacts of climate change on health both direct, indirect, and tertiary. And I, I won't go too much into this because I think Gary really um, talked about this. But just to emphasize that um, most of the time, especially here in Africa, we focus a lot on the ecological impact. We focus a lot on the impact on livelihoods. A lot of our economies are based on natural resources. So agriculture, fisheries, um, forestry, and so on, which is normal because that's, that's the livelihood of most people. But linked to this impact are issues of pollution, for example. Linked to these impacts are mental health issues that Gary um, was talking about. Linked to these impacts are issues of economic development. And some of them might not be reduction in biodiversity, for example, but it will be a change in how the mosquito behaves, and that increases the malaria incidences, and so on. So there are a lot of other linkages that are not that direct. So in our part of the world, we focus a lot on the livelihood. So I just thought this time we'd look at the other impacts of climate change or the other impacts of human activities on health that are not the traditional things that we usually look at. So that brings me to the next slide. So in this lecture, I've picked three case studies. So the first one, we'll look at malaria. We'll try to focus on malaria because this is something that's really affecting um, a lot of us in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa especially. And then we'll talk about lead, the legacy of lead poisoning. And lastly, we'll end up with the energy crisis, air pollution and health outcomes. I'm using case studies as opposed to just talking generally. So a lot of it will be based on studies that have been conducted in, in Zambia, just to illustrate um, the principles. Thank you. So let's start with malaria. Um, I can see we have more than 800 participants. We may not, have, maybe some of you have never heard of malaria. Malaria is a vector borne disease um, transmitted by a female mosquito. And uh, because it's transmitted in certain temperatures and certain environments, we found that malaria is also sensitive to climate change conditions. And this is raising considerable concerns. 95% of malaria burden lies in Africa. And unfortunately, uh, malaria does lead to death. In Zambia, we still have about 2,000 deaths every year that are attributable to malaria. And even without death, we have a very high burden. We still have over 300 um, incidence rates of malaria per year in the country. So that also translates into lost man hours, um, lost productivity, and so on. So it is still a, a major public health issue. 
And not only in Zambia, but in most of Southern Africa as well, we've seen resurgences in areas where malaria incidences had started to go down, but now we're noticing that the incidences are going up again. Okay, we can move. So a few studies have been done to link, um, to try and see how climate change affects malaria transmission. And we can see here that I've just brought out two that linked rainfall, for example, with malaria incidences and showed a positive correlation. So every one millimeter increase in rainfall had a correspondence increase in the incidence rate of malaria. And this was also linked to humidity. So there are places in my country that are very climate sensitive. And we found that those places are the, are the ones that would still have pockets of high malaria incidences. We also looked at malaria and temperature and again found that there was a positive correlation between temperature increases, those small and malaria incidences as well. So the linkage between the two has been, has been found. Okay. So again, just to illustrate that we still have pregnant women and children most vulnerable to, to malaria, their immunities are a bit low, maybe they, they have low nutrition. So this group is especially vulnerable to malaria. And because of this, our Ministry of Environment embarked on an integrated vector management program, which includes the use of DDT among chemicals that we're using in this program. So just to link that to pollution. So that's how DDT is coming in to try and solve this problem of malaria that we've been facing as a country. Okay. So what is this DDT? Again, for those that don't know, DDT is a persistent organic pollutant. It stands for dichlorodiphenotrichloroethane, um, banned under the Stockholm Convention. So a lot of developed countries, all developed countries, stopped using DDT more than 50 years ago. Uh, but, and, but because of the malaria burden, developing countries um, pressurized for exemptive use. So DDT is only allowed to be used for public health purposes and is under strict regulation in the countries where it's, it's currently being used. Okay. Why are we concerned about this DDT? DDT is persistent, meaning that it bioaccumulates as it travels up the food chain. In the picture that we have there, you can see that the DDT in the water has bioaccumulated by almost 10,000 times by the time it gets to the top layer of that food chain. So if you have, um, here we have three parts per trillion of DDT in the water, it's ending up at 25 parts per million in that falcon that's up there on top of the food chain. So it is bioaccumulating as it travels up the food chain, okay? So what's the problem with this? Um, DDT causes, it has several environmental impacts. Okay, it's been shown to cause thinning of eggshells. It replaces calcium in the eggshells. So when you have eggshells that are thin, that means that the eggshells will have hatching, the eggs will have hatching failure. And therefore you have reduced number of, of birds or chickens or whatever it is that those eggs are incubating. Uh, I don't know how many of us know about the silent spring that, were, that was um, published by a, a, a biologist called Rachel Carson. It talked about a spring that would have birds singing, but because of the reduced population of those birds, the spring became quiet. The birds population was reducing and therefore that brought about the book that she wrote called The Silent Spring. And that was really the birth of this whole chemicals management agenda that, that we see now. Okay. So that is in humans, DDT has been found to cause cancer or it's one of, the, 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 the chemicals that has been linked to cancer, it's ranked as a possible carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And this has been linked to men in China, some men in Australia, and um, they, there's an increased risk of pancreatic um, cancer and liver cancer in those populations. Okay. Um, in terms of reproductive effects, as I said, DDT is an endocrine disruptor, meaning that um, it mimics certain hormones in the body. So what this means is it, it might lead to fetal losses in pregnancies because it has estrogenic properties or its breakdown products are estrogenic. So then you, you can't carry your baby to full term. So you have miscarriages. Um, if the baby is lactating, you might have shorter lactation durations because of the, the DDT that's mimicking um, 
estrogen in the body, okay? In men, it also has been linked to lower male fertility and reduced female fertility as well. And I must mention that one of these studies was actually carried out in South Africa, very, very close to home, okay? Um, DDT has neurodevelopmental effects on children as well. So again, studies have been done everywhere in the world, including two studies that have been done in Africa now, showing that DDT does affect um, children's neurodevelopment in terms of cognitive behavior, their motor function, social development, and so on. Okay, so given, given this scenario, why do we still use DDT in Zambia? Why, why are we still using it in Africa? Um, so what do we choose? Do we choose to have 2,000 deaths or do we choose to have the, the effects that maybe we still need to do more studies on? This is the dilemma that a lot of our governments are faced with, especially now with climate change and the linkage with malaria. What do the governments do? Okay. So we went ahead and tried to see um, what was happening in the environment and we did find very high levels of DDT in soil and water as we can see from that, um, that graph that we have there. We also found that um, the houses where DDT was sprayed within the 50 meters radius had water bodies, various water bodies, streams, taps, um, boreholes around those houses. There was a variety of crops being grown around the houses. There was a variety of livestock being reared around those houses. These are typical um, some of them are typical rural areas, others are urban areas, but by and large, we can see there that we did have those various uh, exposure pathways around uh, the houses, the households where the DDT is being sprayed. Okay. In comparison with other countries, as you can see, um, our soil levels of DDT are almost double um, that of Uganda, where the DDT was also recently used and also Mexico, I think it was only phased out in Mexico probably about five to 10 years ago. So our soil levels are still um, quite high, which also leads us to sort of postulate that we might have environmental exposure from the indoor residual spraying that is currently happening for malaria control. Okay. All the houses that were sprayed under IRS had both pregnant women and children. That was illustrated, okay? Also leading us to start wondering, what are the effects of this exposure on the children? What are the effects of this exposure on the women? What are the effects of this exposure on the men? Those are studies that we, we are still, we're still undertaking. Okay, so we move to our next case study, which is looking at lead. Those of you that follow international affairs might know the Blacksmith Institute. The Blacksmith now is called Pure Earth, I believe. The Blacksmith Institute put Zambia on the top 10 as one of the countries that have a city that is one of the most polluted cities in the world. So we didn't make it to the top 10 because we are good in football or anything else, but we made it because we have the most polluted, one of the most polluted cities in the world, unfortunately. Okay, so we can, we can move. Okay, so there was a BBC report that has linked um, this city to pollution. It's a city in the central province of Zambia where it has a long legacy of mining. Again, my country is known for its mining legacy. We mine copper, we have lead, we have some uranium and gold as well. So what is the effect of mining on human health? And that's what made us look into this area as well. So again, lead is a heavy metal. Um, because of its properties, it's used a lot as, in, in, as ballast in ammunition and as a radiation shield. It's insoluble in water, but soluble in some salt. In terms of its absorption, lead is absorbed the, the usual ways of absorption through inhalation, demo exposure and oral exposure. But again, point to note there is that children absorb between 30 to 50% more lead than adults and this increases during pregnancy, okay? So we measured blood lead levels for mothers and children. To mention here is that WHO has set a limit or set a standard for blood lead level at 10 micrograms per deciliter. But in our communities, we measured the lead levels in five different communities 
And as you can see there, we have children that have up to 381 micrograms per deciliter of lead in their blood. So this is almost 30 times, this is more than 30 times the limit set by WHO. So you might be wondering what effects does this have on the children? With such high levels, what are the effects on the children? And again, we went ahead to try and look at the neurodevelopment outcomes in some of these children of these communities. And this is, this is what we found. So we did look at um, various neurodevelopment domains. And again, it looks like um, without planning it, we're all looking at mental health. So we looked at uh, personal social problem solving, fine motor, gross motor and communication. And we did find that a lot of the children, more than a quarter of them fell below the cutoff point, especially for problem solving and fine, fine motor, okay? And there were significant differences by area. Qualitatively, we asked the caregivers what their main concerns were. And as you can see, most of them talked about hearing problems, hearing difficulties, um, lack of interaction of the children with others. So psychosocial issues of social interaction, delayed speech, delayed walking, um, some children are too quiet, others are too active. So again, this borders on, um, it, it, it also shows that there's something happening in this population that is a bit unique. That, and then it, we come to our last case study, which is looking at energy. Okay, as we know, um, Zambia hasn't been spared from the effects of climate change in terms of our water levels. We've had reduced water levels in a lot of our hydro power stations. We can move, Felix. And these reduced water levels has made electricity become increasingly um, short in a lot of areas. And this has led to unsustainable harvesting of trees, which has uh, an impact on biodiversity, but also the increased usage of charcoal and other fuel wood um, for cooking and other household uses. And um, these have various impacts or health effects on the population. Respiratory infections in Zambia are among the top two causes of death since 20, 2013. So this is very recent that we're seeing increased numbers of respiratory infections in the country, okay? So again, to cope with all these uh, energy shortages, households are resorting to various sources of, of fuel. And um, there's prediction by scientists that we'll see an increased incidences of allergies, respiratory diseases, because the air is getting warmer. And as air gets warmer, it's getting more charged with pollutants, and therefore it's moving longer distances and affecting more, more people. So we, we did this study just to understand this linkage a little bit more and also see what interventions could be put in place that would address this issue. Okay. So in terms of energy options, um, not surprising, we found that more than 95% of the communities still use charcoal as their main source of fuel. And the 5% that remains is shared um, among electricity, among what wooden pellets, a few people were using wooden pellets, a few are using gas, and some surprisingly are using crop residue. This study was done in a, in a peri-urban area in the capital city of Lusaka. So you, you can see how this energy crisis is, is a big problem. People are actually using crop residue to cook, to cook with, okay? Location of the cooking Sites. We, are, we are linking this to health. Where are the people cooking using this charcoal? A lot of them, more than half of them are cooking outside, but we still have a good number. More than a quarter of them are cooking indoors and some are cooking in both outside and indoors. Later on, we'll see how that, play out, how that plays out, okay? We measured air pollutants in these households, indoor air pollutants, and we focused on carbon monoxide. Again, we're health professionals, so we know what carbon monoxide does when it enters somebody's body. So we, we focused on carbon monoxide, we looked at volatile organic compounds and particulate matter. And as we can see from that graph, almost all the parameters, apart from PM10, are above the WHO limit. Carbon monoxide is three times above 
And again, that, that graph says the higher the concentration, the more unhealthy that air is. Okay. We can move. So related to children, again, um, you see that I have a passion for children. So we found that 75% um, of the sampled house, households had children there. And more than half of them reported cooking with children in the same area. This is in Africa. This is in a typical African setting where a lot of mothers keep their children on the back when they're cooking. So when they're cooking, they have the baby on the back in, 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 in those kitchens. And we had a good number reporting fires and burns in some of those households. So apart from the inhalation of the pollutants, you also have accidental fires. You also have burns that result from using these energy sources. Okay. And also, we, we also had a, a few other health effects that were reported, but worrying was um, unconsciousness, dizziness, and so on, because that, that will make us think that there must have been some carbon monoxide poisoning in some of those houses. So when we analyzed statistically, we found that the houses where they were cooking indoors with poor ventilation had the higher prevalence of respiratory conditions. Again, this is, uh, when you've done enough science, you understand that, yes, this probably happens, but this was the first time we were doing this kind of study. And we did find that, indeed, um, poor ventilation had the poorer health outcomes. Okay. Can move. So this is just a photo gallery to just show us um, a snapshot of the kind of communities that we that we're talking about so um, rural communities mud touched houses um grass houses uh, shared water resources beautiful you can see the trees there so very beautiful environment that we live in okay you can move. um this is a peri-urban area typical peri-urban area in in, a, in an inner city and very very poor environmental conditions these children spend 12 or more hours outside playing outside Shared water resources, a lot of them um, use a communal tap or they use communal water resources. So if, if there's any pollution in those water resources, you can imagine the population that's at risk. Okay. So it brings us to the question, is it all doom and gloom? You know, all these negative, all these negative um, slides that I've been presenting, is it all doom and gloom? Where do we go from here? And I, I think Gary started talking about um, exactly what, I, what, what I'm also going to say. We transform how we do science. We need to move, I love the planetary health um, slogan, moving from knowledge. We transform how we do science. We come to real life settings. We, we move away from thinking that the world is, is, is a kind of engineered laboratory where we can keep temperature and pressure constant we come down to the world where things are different, where communities are different, where there are social interactions that change from place to place. And translate this knowledge innovation into packaged interventions that will meet various societal and ecosystem needs. So no copy and paste, there's no one size fits all. Every intervention is specific to the area that we're looking at, okay? Internationally, a lot of, well, a lot of uh, things are being done. We, we, the world leaders meet every year and come up with agreements within the Paris Agreement. We don't know how successful that is. At national level, we have various policies. Um, in Zambia, we have a health and all policy, in he a health and all policies policy. But the question is, are these enough? Are policy interventions enough? And my answer to that is an emphatic no. We can move, Kelly. The, the set the direction, they help, but the change, the change happens at the local level. The change happens in the community. So again, we agree with Gary that the change has to be done at the local community. Let's get the knowledge, but go back to the communities and hear from the communities, work with the communities to structure those changes that will work, that will work for them. Okay. We need to make a choice between present benefits versus discounted costs. I'm thinking in this case of the issue of malaria, the issue of mining. Yes, of course, for economic development, we need to mine, we need the forest. But what, what, at what cost? We have to reduce malaria incidences. We have to reduce malaria mortality, but at what cost? So there has to be a balance that has to be struck. 
we have to look at both the present and the future as we make our daily decisions, okay? And of course, we have to, that's what brings us together this evening. Um, we have to look at the planet as a whole. We have to look at the planet as something that's transdisciplinary. It's not just about human beings. It's about the smallest fish in the, in, in, in the ocean. It's about the smallest bird in the, in the sky. And we have to gain the knowledge. In Africa, we're very excited to have this planetary health initiative because we're, we're getting resources that we can easily transform, that we can easily adapt and use to teach our own students. We have to get the knowledge for us to know where we can intervene, what is being done in various parts of the world, what can we learn from, how can people from other parts of the world learn about resilience. Gary talked about mental health. I always say that Africans are probably one of the most resilient mentally people that because if you think about all the effects of climate change, you can find them in any sub-Saharan country. If you think about any health issues, HIV, um, now we have COVID pandemic and so on, you will find them here. So what can we learn from different parts of the world? How can we integrate all this learning to give us this transformation that we'd like to have? So shifting resources, sharing experiences, eliminating geographical barriers, um, like we are doing now, we have more than 800 participants. There's no geographical barrier here. We're, we're having this conversation. So having more of these kind of conversations across geographical barriers, across um, academic disciplines, more of these kind of interactions. Okay. And of course, from a public health side, look at the bigger picture. Um, don't just kill the mosquito. Maybe the answer is in changing how we build houses. Maybe the answer is integrating vector control into climate change discussions. Maybe the answer is looking at the total environment, the ecology, the water, the soil. So we, we have to put our heads together and not think in silos, not think in a sectoral manner, okay? And to end, I'll end with a quote from Rachel Carson. I'm sure you can see that she's one of my favorite, um, my favorite people. One of the most alarming aspects of chemical pollution of water is the fact that in a river or a lake or a reservoir or that matter in the glass of water served at our dinner table are mingled chemicals that no responsible chemist would ever think of combining in his laboratory. So if we don't mix these chemicals in a lab, why are we mixing them in the water we're drinking? Why are we mixing them in the food that we're eating? Why are we mixing them in the air that we're breathing? Okay. So thank you very much once again for this opportunity. And just to remind ourselves that the earth is in our hands. We are the ones that can make a difference. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nasiko. Great uh, contribution. And uh, for the ones who don't know that, Rachel Carson was one of the persons who kind of founded the uh, environmental movement in the early 60s. So, um, and this is what we are doing, we have to do is kind of to found something together that goes beyond what we have so far. Mm -hmm. um, what I would like to come back to as a question to both of you, but also as a comment is, both of you have clearly pointed out the complexity of the different dimensions of to and starting to understand how it plays out, but also that the solution space is very much on a community level and strengthening the communities in also seeing what the social resources are that can be tapped in and how we are kind of saving and securing the social resources to kind of tackle the challenges that are in front of you. So my Gary, for first question goes to Gary, kind of what do you see in the CQS kind of contribution? How do you see yourself reflected in it? Um, mm -hmm. Kind of what, how, how would you like to comment? No, I, I see real synergy and uh, not just thematically, but practically, because everyone that, um, you know, can be marshaled on the ground to address their malaria vector problem or their water contamination problem or, you know, other climate mitigation issues um, is also a suffering person or, or, or working against a grain of, of fear and anxiety. And so, so this, there's a real connection between the collective efficacy to work on climate and environmental solutions and mental and emotional well-being. They fuel each other. 
um, because acting is also the best antidote to despair. So um, uh, they both land on the ground level, uh, but they uh, both of what we're saying, but they are uh, two, you know, two sides of the same new dynamic we have to set up where we're looking uh, beyond just what big agencies and big policies and big government level folks can do, but the ground game, what, you know, all these huge transformations are gonna need all of us where we live on our blocks mm -hmm. uh, or in our villages uh, uh, to do some work. And mm -hmm. how are we supported to do that? Mm -hmm. Nosiko, you wanna comment what you were taking from Gary's uh, contribution? Yes, Martin. Um, I think I took everything, I was taking notes. <laughs> I was, take, I was taking notes as, as he was presenting, and it's it's um it's it's very fascinating to see the various um, interventions that Gary is involved in. Very very exciting for me to see the practic the practical um, actions that can be done. I think sometimes it's easy to get bogged down in the problem that you actually um, don't know where to start from. So for me, it's um of course the learning you know, uh, things like heat stress and mental health, that's something that, again, we just take for granted. You know, we have temperatures, sometimes we have places that go up to 43 degrees. And, and you know, students are writing exams in those temperatures. So just to see that there's this whole movement on mental health, um, ecological anxiety, again, I took, I was taking ecological stress, ecological grief. I think a lot of us feel the ecological grief. You, you feel like weeping when you see what's happening. So just putting that and packaging it to see it packaged for me is, is extremely, extremely interesting. And I can't wait to go into my next academic year and, and, and um, play this, this lecture for my students. So then we can have it already packaged. But I think more importantly is the action. You know, like everything else, it's really, so what are we going to do? So what can we do? In a place like Kawe, the place with the lead pollution, we did a small study on quality of life, Martin, and we found that the mothers in those communities have that anxiety. You know, they see these very high blood lead levels in their children. You could see from their concerns, their children are not growing the way they should be growing socially, communication. So these mothers are dealing with that stress on a daily basis without any support, without any um, counseling without them. So the focus is let's reduce the blood lead levels. Let's give the children treatment. Let's give them chelation therapy. But how about the mothers? How about the fathers who are still going to work and scavenge on those minds? So there's, there's a whole mental health -ish dimension that we've sort of left out because we're focusing on the bread and butter kind of issue. So very, very interesting for me. And I can't wait to go and into those slides to go and read those journals more and just to learn from Gary how you're running those various groups that you're involved in. I found that very fascinating. You have so many groups that you're involved in. Yeah, just to learn, just to learn more from there. So, so just by the two of you meeting you, there will be more transformation in this direction in Zambia. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that uh, uh, the video will be more than used. So, so Gary will be a famous person in Zambia and Lucico yes. back in New York. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so Sylvia, should you take some of the questions from? Yeah, Hannah, maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, thank you very much for your inspiring and rich presentations, Nozikyo and Gary. We received a great amount of questions um, in the Q&A, so I want to thank everybody for participating so actively. Um, and I'll start right away. So there's a first question to both of you. Um, how can vulnerable and deprived populations rare raise awareness about climate change, despite the fact that other questions can often be more urgent um, than they are in high income countries. Um, even though, of course, on the long run, long run, climate change will have such a huge impact. So could you maybe both just comment briefly from your perspectives? I think Gary, go first. You sure? <laughs> go, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's a great question. And, and it also is, you can stick mental health in there also, you know, how do you get people to think about mental health when they've got all, you know, other, you know, other things. And, and so I often, I've decided that mental health uh, is, is a means to an end. Uh, and I talk about it more that way than an end in itself. Um, uh, and so it's really finding how does talking about this problem help the other thing you're, you're really worried about? 
So if you go into a school, they're worried mm -hmm. the kids aren't graduating. Well, you know what? What I know about mental health can help that problem. And so it's similar mm -hmm. about climate mitigation. If you're going into, into a place that's critical to climate mitigation but doesn't know it, you show how working on it helps the thing that they're really otherwise worried about. And, it, and because both climate and mental health, all these are cross-cutting, you know, a very um, 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 determinative sorts of things, you can find those. You can find those connections. So it's really worry, you know, what, I, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm working on, uh, you know, can, can help your outcomes. Um, and showing that uh, can be very effective. And I, I, I agree, Gary. And the, 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 the mental climate change in vulnerable populations now is more real than ever before. It's, it's, it's not just something that we're seeing on TV. It's not just something that we're, you know, that we can see Greta complaining about. You know, when, when you hear her um, addressing world leaders and talking about how dare you, it's real. We have children that are not writing their exams because there's no electricity. So you can Im imagine the amount of anxiety on the children, on the parents. So it's now become so interlinked with um, the livelihoods of people that everybody's talking about it now. Maybe some people didn't link the two, but the linkage now is, is without question. Everybody now knows that climate change is a real issue. Maybe what we just don't know is the different kinds of interventions and how they are linked to climate change. Like Ari said, I think mental health is usually seen as a softer issue. Pollution is rarely uh, connected to climate change, but we're seeing more of those linkages coming out now. The linkage with health also, we're seeing more of that coming out now. So increasingly, we, we, we're trying to connect the dots. We're trying to connect the fishing, the, the depletion of fisheries and health. We're trying to connect the temperature and malaria so that we're not seeing these as two separate things, but as one, as one entity. So more and more, the awareness is, is increasing and it's increasing in populations that are not even as literate as you'd think they should be, but they, they actually understand this, maybe even more than we academicians, because they live in these communities, they live with those resources. So they can see that there's definitely something that has changed. So I hope that answers that question, yeah. Yes, thank you. So, yeah, we have more questions. There's one for you, Gary, um, also about the um, interconnectedness of things. Um, so in order to create a positive feedback loop between our collective mental status and our collective functioning regarding climate impact um, mitigation and adaptation, which kind of mindset on the society level should we aim for and how could we get there? Yeah, um, yeah, there's a whole, you know, issue that I didn't even raise that's sort of implied in that question of um, you know, what does it take for a society to be more, um, you know, generative, forward-facing, um, pro-socially facing, uh, you know, and it worked that way. You know, here I'm sitting in the United States where, where people can't even, you know, take minimum precautions to save their neighbor's life. And so you know, how, how are we going to build a regenerative, um, you know, sustainable community with that kind of, uh, you know, stuff going on. How do we change the social climate in that in that in that sort of way? And um, and I think you know it gets back to the same answer. You you you've got to start it um, at the ground level. And um, I mean, leadership really matters, and we've lacked that. And hopefully, that will change in setting the tenor and the expectation and, and the normalcy of talking that way, and permission for other people to talk that way. Um, but um, uh, for for mental health, for what mental health has to offer to that um, uh, work is again my point about putting the work somewhere else. So for example, um, you know, I'm really interested in how um, other ways of mentoring youth, for example, I was just talking with a colleague this morning on this, who has um, brought all these groups that do youth mentoring for you know, troubled youth or at, at, at risk youth. And there you have a, already a social mechanism to try to reach youth. I don't have to build a new mechanism. There's already a credible social mechanism that's working on that, that's credible to that. What can I bring into that? What can I use that as a delivery for, for more content, for more skills, for more kinds of help? And I think that's the way we all have to think, is um, these, these, these 
existing social structures and opportunities for building social glue and action, what more can we bring into that? So for, for the mental health perspective, that's what I'm thinking of. How do we re-engineer mental health work so it can be delivered through those other um, ways that people come together around and, and feel connected through? Mm -hmm. So on one level, that means when we are in a community to rediscover what are the resources within the community, right? Right. And, and then, it's a, and then it's a virtuous... To get to know people, to see what are the resources, yep. and then see how what we bring can be connected to the already existing resources and concerns. Right. So it becomes a virtuous cycle. So if we know that... Um, um, uh, pessimism and depression and, 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 and trauma make it harder for people to really come together to work on, uh, you know, changing how they uh, work as a neighborhood in terms of emissions or other, or solve problems like NSECO is wanting to bring people to do. Um, so you bring the, the mental health work to environmental justice groups, to, you know, groups that are working on um, helping kids avoid, you know, spread bed nets for malaria. You, you, bring, you bring that work, you, you seam it together uh, pragmatically, um, and then you get these virtuous cycles to work. So then it helps the effectiveness of the, bed, of the village bed net campaign to have this added oomph of also being able to work on the emotional things people are going through. That improves the emotional things, which increases the social capital and collective, uh, you know, energy to work on the bed netting problem, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's. We have to cr not only understand these miss, you know, social connections, but we have to re-energize them through giving them more capacity to do more things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, do we take more questions, or we move? Yeah, maybe we take uh, take one more question. And I want, actually wanted to come back to the question I had uh, when you finished your talk because I think that fits like perfectly to what you just said, Gary. Because we have this concept of health and all policies, but I think it's like very policy focused. And Nuziko and you, you're talking about like how communities can engage in creating healthier communities. So, yeah, I was wondering what, how can could we promote this kind of concept? better and how should we call it maybe like is it health for all uh, <laughs> and does that include already that everybody's also responsible for health for all um can can, can i take that yeah. in zambia we call it community health and i think zambia like most um, african countries is very community we're very community centered you know they always say a child is raised by a village so this is a concept that we live by. You know, everybody is each other's neighbor. Um, families are very close to one another. So this community concept really, really works um, back home. And the health model that we're using in Zambia now is very much community driven. You find that um, in communities, you have community, what we call community health volunteers. So even in places where we work, our entry point is the health facility. And then we get community health volunteers because those are people that live within the community. And if you want to transmit any message, you go through those volunteers. The people will trust them more. You won't believe that it's not, if, if, if I go to a rural area from Lusaka, everybody will look at me and a bit suspicious, but the moment they see me with that community health volunteer, they see me with, the, with their counselor, the local leaders, then they get that trust. So these are the models that we're trying to build, like, like Gary was saying, to build the already existing framework and just have the interventions through those systems that are already working. So th this we're finding to work very, very well. We work with the community health volunteers. We work with the traditional leaders. Again, Zambia is very traditional. Um, so you work with the chief. If a chief says something, if a chief gives a message, it's very easy to get more buy-in from the community than if I go there as a professor. You know, they look at me and think, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. But the moment you go through the trusted um, community leaders, you have more buy-in from the community. So we're finding that to be very effective. Thank you. Sylvia. Yeah. And Sylvia, Sylvia also, I, what I would, the answer to your question I'd say is similar to that, is you need parallel process. You need, uh, and if you, my slide where I show all these city agencies and all these dots of activity on the ground, so you have um, policy level heads coming together about policy discussions, but their agencies in parallel time are also working on ground level work. So, 
So you create a mid-level cadre of management that, that, that is in between those dots. And, and that can start to change the culture and, and the way of functioning of these other sectors to absorb this new health or mental health work. Unfortunately, that process I learned also got stalled in New York um, because it also needs ongoing political will and leadership to believe in it. Um, um, and it takes a while to mature to have its own momentum, and 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 we didn't have we didn't have that, and that was a big lesson learned. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe we can go on then, Martin. I would say to to Zonia, and then I will. Thank you very much, Nziko and Gary, for your great input and the discussion. And yeah, thank we you. really hope that maybe even out of just lecture, some collaboration, whatever, comes mm -hmm. into being. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah. And so I will hand over to Sonia and we'll give a short introduction as well. So Sonia, you're a teacher and researcher uh, in Bern, in a city in Switzerland, at the University of Applied Science, and you have a master's degree in food, nutrition and health. And actually, you took part in our last uh, Planetary Health Academy in for the spring term. and. You get, got inspired by participating to create your own module on planetary health at your university. And maybe you could tell us a little bit more about it. Yes, sure. Thank you. And thank you also for the invitation. It's a real great honor and big pleasure for me to, to be here and uh, to be part of the Planetary Health Academy. So yeah, it's actually exactly as you said. So. Um, it was at the first Planetary Health Academy, I think one of the last sessions where several transformative examples um, have been shown. And yeah, and I, I was just thinking I really have to, I, I mean, if we really mean it um, that we want to transform something, I, I have to act now. And so I um, had then the opportunity um, to apply for a, a fund from our university and uh, got admitted <laughs> yeah and now i'm i'm like designing uh, the module i will happily present to you if you want yeah yeah great shall i start yeah uh, i have some slides just um for you to um yeah so i think um i already started with um some of the main points so i'm working at the university of applied sciences uh, here in bern and especially or to be more precise, I'm working in the health department and we have several disciplines in, health, in the health department. So midwifery, nursing, nutrition and dietetics where I am working and physiotherapy. And we are all working on several fields of performance. And the example of transformation I will present to you now is um, situated in the bachelor studies. Um, where I created a module which can be attended from all students um, of the health department, but also from students, from other bachelor students, from other departments. So right now I'm in collaboration with the School of Agriculture, Forest and Food Sciences uh, at the Bern University of Applied Sciences as well, and with people from the business school. <clears throat> and we are about, about to design a transdisciplinary module within the framework of planetary health. And um, this is an elective module. So all students from all these three different departments can choose to, um, to go through this module and it will start in fall uh, 21, so quite soon. <laughs> And, um, but also we were thinking about inviting other students from other departments. These are um, the other departments at our university. They will be able to attend the, the transdisciplinary module, module, but we will then also really address them more precisely in uh, 2022 when we really will um, get in, involved with experts from these departments as well. So perhaps uh, just to give you a quick overview about what the leaders of the module, so the name is Planetary Health, Climate Crisis Health and Us, and the lead really puts uh, very much the focus on how our health as human beings depends on the health of nature. 
Uh, and there was we follow uh, not like the, the classical concept of sustainability, but um, a very strong concept of sustainability, which says that without society, there's no economy and both are really dependent from the environment. And within the module, we try to um, achieve that students gain, first of all, knowledge about the whole topic of planetary health and then also reflect on their role of their own disciplines and also of their interactions with other disciplines. And in the end, um, really contribute to um, get active and get creative and um, with, uh, with a project work where they really try to implement a transdisciplinary project. So we will try to address these like three steps accordingly. So first of all, they will, they will uh, acquire the knowledge from the Planetary Health Academy, um, which because all the, the material is online, then they will reflect and transfer what they learned there into their own settings and to their own working settings. And then as a third step, they will get active. So I brought uh, with me an example for you just to get your kind of an idea a bit more precise. Let's start at the second step. So as, as at the reflection uh, step. So imagine, th let's think about a hospital which would like to become more sustainable. And um, they decide to implement the planetary health diet, which um, most of you might know. Um, there, are several, there are several experts which should be included and involved in developing this uh, diet in the hospital. So for example, the dietitians who will look that um, all nutrients are included um, that the collaboration with the kitchen of the hospital works out well. Um, and then also people with a background in, in agriculture can help to understand um, what they can provide as sustainable sourced food. They might um, come up with ideas for um, gardening projects on the hospital sites or so. Then people from the food science and food tech might um, come up with optimization of, uh, for example, amino acid profiles of plant-based pro um, uh, menus. And of course, economic people um, will help the whole project to really be like a strategic um, point for like a unique selling proposition for the hospital finally. Yeah, and they will like all work together on this project of this green hospital example and then come up with a project uh, with a transdisciplinary project, which is their exam then finally. Um, yeah, and there was I would like to close um, the video doesn't work doesn't matter. You will find the link in the PDF, um, which I think you will upload after today. Um, this is just a short video teaser about the new module. And for those of you who understand German, I am you are very um, invited to have a look at it. And now I'm thanking you for your attention and uh, happy to answer any questions if there are some. And I need help to quit my shared screen. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So yeah, I will ask Hannah if there are any questions. Otherwise, is there? Yeah, Hannah. Yeah, um, so thank you. That's very impressive work. And so nice to see things happening outside of this lecture with what we're doing. Uh, maybe just one brief question in view of um, time. Um, what are the greatest challenges um, you face in integrating these topics into your university and your context, and how do you tackle them? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great question, which I don't know if I can entirely answer it. Um, so I think what really is a great opportunity is that we've we funded like two groups. One group uh, where different people from all different disciplines are involved working on the whole topic of sustainable of sustainability and uh, try to understand what we want to understand within like from planetary health what this really means to us so that's like a working group and um, I think this is one important element and then also to make sure that students are not overwhelmed with like the workload at all like generally uh, I think this is also quite kind of a Greater issue. We are thinking about summer school also to navigate 
works with these problems. I mean, these are the first like main uh, things that come to my mind right now. I think there are several more, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Sonia. So um, before we come to the close, I wanted to give a chance to Sabine. Do you have any comments to the presentations from today, Sabine? You wanna share something or not today? Both is fine. Not really, sorry. Not really, fine. But then I wanted to give the opportunity to Nasiko and, and uh, Gary just to say a few words to close the session for you. And then I will say a few words and then we close. Nasiko? Mm, thanks, Martin. Just very quickly, uh, this is very, very enlightening. And uh, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed Sonia's presentation, obviously, about the module. I'll probably get in touch with you, Sonia, to talk a little bit more about that. And a lot of food for thought. So knowledge gained, reflection, and uh, what remains now is the action, the contribution. So yeah. looking forward to more, much, much more interactions. Thank you. Thank you. Gary? Thank you, yeah, and I think uh, everything Nosiko and I talked about applies so much to what appears to be so much of the audience here, students and um, knowledge makers and, and people, uh, we really have to think about curriculum and where our training institutions fit into um, uh, driving some of uh, the ways you know, that I talked about the health system, mental health system need to go. Um, that pipeline and that kind of anchor of what counts as knowledge really matters. And, and, and so you know, how do we really shake up uh, what goes on there? Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all three, because uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we do the, this, this series is to get to know great people, to get to know kind of the different dimensions of planetary health and understand much more the intricacies and the complexities, but also to see the emerging patterns of what leads to transformative action. And I'm very convinced today from today that this notion of community health and planetary health need to dance with each other. One without the other will not work. So this can be also a, a real inspiration for us to play with this. It's already building on what we'll see tomorrow with the Lancet countdown policy brief for Germany recommendations that will come, which is very much to crown it, to crown transformation in the transformation of communities, of cities, of counties, kind of on the ground. And I think that's very much in our spirit, but thank you very much for the clarification through the presentations of all of you. And I'm sure we will see you again and we will be part of this growing network of people who drives this forward, who are leading the change that is needed now. Thank you very much. And now I hand over to Sylvia to give a few announcements for the next weeks. Yeah, I will talk about in the, the lecture in two weeks. We already talked about ethics a little bit and next time it's going to be very interdisciplinary as well. Um, because we're having a clinical professor of nursing, a medical doctor, a philosopher and a anthropologist. So we're very much looking forward to this mixed discussion team, I would say. And we're happy to see you all again then and have a look at the um, uh, working papers that Sophie creates every week for you and you can find it on our website as well and have a nice evening day and whatever bye <laughs> <laughs>